Spring Boot and Spring Data JPA make the handling of transactions extremely simple. They enable you to declare your preferred transaction handling and provide seamless integration with Hibernate and JPA. The only thing you need to do is to annotate one of your methods with Add Transactional. But what does that actually do? Which methods should you annotate with Transactional? And why can you set different propagation levels? I will answer all of these questions in this video. To make that a little bit easier to understand, I will focus on local transactions. These are transactions between your application and one external system, for example your database. Hi, I'm Tom Janssen. If you are new here and you want to learn how to create your entity mappings with ease, build incredible efficient persistence layers with Hibernate and Spring and all types of other Java persistence related stuff, start now by subscribing and clicking the bell so you don't miss anything. And if you have any relevant topic that you want me to cover on this channel and on my blog, please let me know in the comments below. I will try my best to cover those. From a Spring application point of view, the same concepts also apply to distributed transactions. So if you are using distributed transactions, I recommend that you keep reading and research the required configuration parameters for distributed transactions afterward. Okay, before we can talk about Spring's transaction support, we need to take a step back and explain database transactions in general and take a quick look at JDBC's transaction management. This is necessary because Spring's transaction management is based on the transaction management provided by your database and the JDBC specification. Transactions manage the changes that you perform in one or more systems. These can be databases, message brokers, or any other kind of software system. The main goal of a transaction is to provide asset characteristics to ensure the consistency and validity of your data. ACID is an acronym that stands for Atomicity, Consistency, Isolation and Durability. Atomicity describes an all or nothing principle. Either all operations performed within the transaction get executed or none of them. That means if you commit the transaction successfully, you can be sure that all operations got performed. It also enables you to abort a transaction and roll back all operations if an error occurs. The consistency characteristic ensures that your transaction takes the system from one consistent state to another consistent state. That means that either all operations were rolled back and the data was set back to the state you started with, or the changed data passed all consistency checks. In a relational database, that means that the modified data needs to pass all constraint checks, like from key or unique constraints defined in your database. Isolation means that changes that you perform within a transaction are not visible to any other transactions until you commit them successfully. Durability ensures that your committed changes get persisted. As you can see, a transaction that ensures these characteristics makes it very easy to keep your data valid and consistent. Relational databases support asset transactions and the JDBC specification enables you to control them. Spring provides annotations and different transaction managers to integrate transaction management into their platform and to make it easier to use. But in the end, it all boils down to the features provided by these lower level APIs. There are three main operations you can do via the Java SQL connection interface to control an asset transaction on your database. You can start a transaction by getting a connection and deactivating auto commit. This gives you control over the database transaction. Otherwise, you would automatically execute each SQL statement within a separate transaction. Commit a transaction by calling the commit method on the connection interface. This tells your database to perform all required consistency checks and persist the changes permanently. Roll back all operations performed during the transaction by calling the rollback method on the connection interface. You usually perform this operation if an SQA statement failed or if you detected an error in your business logic. As you can see, conceptually, controlling a database transaction isn't too complex, but implementing these operations consistently in a huge application is a lot harder than it might seem. That's where Spring's transaction management comes into play. Spring provides all the boilerplate code that's required to start, commit, or roll back a transaction. It also integrates with Hibernate's and JPA's transaction handling. If you're using Spring Boot, this reduces your effort to a transactional annotation on each interface, method, or class that shall be executed within a transactional context. 
If you're using Spring without Spring Boot, you need to activate the Transaction Management by annotating your application class with Enable Transaction Management. Here you can see a simple example of a service with a transactional method. The transactional annotation tells Spring that a transaction is required to execute this method. When you inject the author service somewhere, Spring generates a proxy object that wraps the author service object and provides the required code to manage the transaction. By default, that proxy starts a transaction before your request enters the first method that's annotated with a transactional. After that method got executed, the proxy either commits the transaction or rolls it back if a runtime exception or error occurred. Everything that happens in between, including all method calls, gets executed within the context of that transaction. The transactional annotation supports a set of attributes that you can use to customize the behavior. The most important ones are propagation, read-only, rollback for, and no rollback for. Let's take a closer look at each of them. Spring's propagation enum defines seven values that you can provide to the propagation attribute of the transactional annotation. They enable you to control the handling of the existing and creation of new transactions. You can choose between require to tell Spring to either join an active transaction or to start a new one if the method gets called without a transaction. This is the default behavior. Supports to join an active transaction if one exists. If the method gets called without an active transaction, this method will be executed without a transactional context. Mandatory to join an active transaction if one exists or throw an exception if the method gets called without an active transaction. Never to throw an exception if the method gets called in the context of an active transaction. Not supported to suspend an active transaction and to execute the method without any transactional context. Requires new to always start a new transaction for this method. If the method gets called with an active transaction, that transaction gets suspended until this method got executed. Nested to start a new transaction if the method gets called without an active transaction. If it gets called with an active transaction, Spring sets a save point and rolls back to that save point if an exception occurs. If you want to implement a read-only operation, I recommend using a DTO protection. It enables you to only read the data you actually need for your business code and provides a much better performance. But if you decide to use an entity projection anyways, you should at least mark your transaction as read-only. Since Spring 5.1, this sets Hibernate's query hint org.hibernate.readonly and avoids dirty checks on all retrieved entities. I explained earlier that the Spring proxy automatically rolls back your transaction if a runtime exception or error occurred. You can customize that behavior using the rollback for and no rollback for attributes of the transactional annotation. As you might guess from its name, the rollback for attribute enables you to provide an array of exception classes for which the transaction shall be rolled back. And the no rollback for attribute accepts an array of exception classes that shall not cause a rollback of the transaction. In this example, I want to roll back the transaction for all subclasses of the exception class, except the entity not found exception. Spring Boot and Spring Data JPA provide an easy to use transaction handling. You only need to annotate your interface, class, or method with Spring's transactional annotation. Spring then wraps your service in a generated proxy that joins an active transaction or starts a new one and commits or votes the transaction back after your method got executed. You can customize the default behavior using the propagation, read-only, rollback for and no rollback for attributes. The propagation attribute gives you control over the handling of existing and the creation of new transactions. If your method gets called within the context of an active transaction, you can, for example, decide if your method shall join that transaction, create a new one, or fail. You can use the read-only attribute to improve the performance of read-only operations. The rollback for and no rollback for attributes enable you to define which exception classes will cause a rollback of your transaction and which can be handled by your business logic. Scalar projections are returned as object arrays or instances of the tuple interface. Both versions don't provide any type information and are hard to use. Even though they are very efficient for read-only operations, you should avoid them in your application. Okay, that's it for today. If you want to learn more about Hibernate, you should join the free Thoughts on Java library. 
It gives you free access to a lot of member-only content, like a cheat sheet for this video, and an ebook about using native queries with JPA and Hibernate. I'll add the link to it to the video description below. And if you liked today's video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe below. Bye!